Hi everybody, I'm Bill Sanders and this is Watch Art Sci, the art and science of Watts Collection. Uh, what I want to do today is to compare sort of the path that Rolex and Omega uh, have been taking. And I, what I started off thinking was a very divergent path, but it was very different than I thought, uh, especially for Omega. Um, so let's get started. Uh, first of all, uh, keep in mind that Omega is owned by the Swatch Group, and Rolex is uh, is a, I guess you'd call it an independent. It's so huge, it's sort of hard to think of it uh, as an independent, but it is. <clears throat> so let's take a look at some watches uh, represented. Sometimes I have them together, sometimes separately, and we'll we'll take a look at some where things seem to be going. I tried to get watches in the same rough price range. That wasn't always possible, but uh, we'll take a look and see what we've got. Now, the first one I wanted to start off with was something from uh, Omega's Constellation Group and sort of the very basic Rolex, which is an Oyster Perpetual. The... Um, the Constellation has a caliber 8900, it's coaxial, automatic, uh, 25,200 semi -os oscillations per hour, chronometer, uh, 60 hours, so 60 hours uh, of a, before you had to rewind it. 39 millimeter stainless steel and it's 15,000 Gauss. Well, <laughs> 15,000 Gauss is, is very sort of anti-magnetic or actually non-magnetic and that's great I mean I've got some watches that uh, don't have that get magnetized pretty easily uh, but fortunately not too many of them this one also has uh, two barrels uh, mounted in series which will give it a longer uh, run on it now one of the things that they they have in this watch is that they're using uh, silicon hairsprings. Now, I'm not a big fan of uh, silicon hairsprings, but that's neither here nor there. That's what they're doing. That's also how they're getting a chronometer rating uh, because you have such stability in the uh, silicon hairsprings and they're totally unaffected by magnetic fields. Now, the Oyster Perpetual uh, caliber 3230, 28,800, uh, semi oscillations per hour. I think just about all Rolexes now have the same uh, frequency. Chronometer, all Rolexes are chronometer rated, 70 hours automatic. Have something, an escapement called the chrono energy escapement. That's compared with the coaxial escapement on the Omega. Uh, 6150, pretty close to the same price, 41 millimeters and what they call oyster steel, which is their type of stainless steel. Now, these next two are more of a, the nautical ones, the, the divers. And, and to be frank with you, they're both desk divers. I, I don't think, if you, if you go into a dive shop, you're not going to see watches like that, even if they're rich dive shops. They're going to have some other kinds of things. These are nice watches uh, that you could use for diving, and they have a movable, uh, a rotating bezel where you can set up certain things for it. But, uh, they, you know, I don't think for the most part these would actually be used in diving. Uh, now, the Omega uh, Seamaster Professional Diver does have a helium release valve up at uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, again, for your, at your desk, <laughs> I think for the most part. Caliber 8800 automatic, 15,000 Gauss again, coaxial escapement in the silicon balance, 55 hours. And then it also runs at the frequency of 25200. I think the 25200 frequency was set up for the coaxial escapement, uh, 5400. Now the Rolex Submariner date, and I selected the date one because um, the Seamaster has date down at uh, six o'clock. It's not a very big one, and uh, the Submariner date. If you if you like date on your watches, I like this one because boy, you can really see it. 
uh, a lot of people don't like that little magnifying glass at three o'clock over the date. They call it a cyclops. I like it because you can see it. <laughs> uh, now, uh, minute seconds, uh, and again, another chronometer, 41 millimeters. Now, this is twice the price, uh, $10,600. Um, why is it twice the price? I don't know. I'm not saying that it's twice as good or the Omega Seamaster is half as good. I just have no idea why. <laughs> but maybe that's it. I know it's incredibly popular, and that may have something to do with it. Now, these next two, this is this is where things are off a little. Now, the first two Omegas we looked at, both of them had silicon escapements, this huge amount of uh, Goss, 15,000. And then we come to the Omega DeVille, and I was very surprised. The Caliber 2627 is Omega's version of the ETA 2892-A2, which is a hugely reliable, excellent movement. And it's used by a lot of them. Now, remember, Omega's part of Swatch, and Swatch owns ETA, so they can have as many of those as they want. And then they can call us the 2627. Uh, this one has a power reserve indicator, which is this is nice, I guess. I, I, I think with automatics, you know, you're running around and stuff and winding a watch all the time. I, I don't think a power reserve indicator is as necessary as something that's a hand wound one like this one. And the power reserve indicator is on the back, so it's not doesn't mess up the uh, uh, dial. I don't think they mess up the dial too much anyway. Uh, certainly they don't on this uh, Omega DeVille. All right, now this doesn't have, have any of the Gauss value that the the ones with the silicon have. Uh, there, the issues with silicon is that you can't have a curved regulator. Everything is a free spun regulator, which actually is probably, uh, is probably considered a little better type of regulator because uh, it, you get more precise uh, adjustments by turning these little weights. Hard to do though. So anyway, this one's 49.50. And again, this is another type, the DeVille, uh, the Omega, the Seamaster, those are all different types of Omegas. Now, the Rolex Milgoss, here you have, this is sort of funny, I compared these two because this is one pair where you have, uh, you do have some kind of Goss setting, 1000, which doesn't seem like much compared to the 15,000, but this is done uh, with a parachrome hairspring and not a, a silicon one, so I have a lot of respect for that. Always have liked this uh, Rolex, the Milgauss. Something about it I always liked. Uh, automatic 28,000. All of them, I think, are 28,000 uh, semi oscillations per hour. 40 millimeters oyster, uh, oyster steel. 9,150. These have gone up a lot. In the last few years, uh, Rolexes have really shot up in price. Okay, uh, moving right along, we get to sort of the main show, at least as far as I'm concerned, of Omega. And this is the Speedmaster, especially the Speedmaster Moonwatch. Now, the first one is really interesting and um, one that is not representative of the original uh, Speedmaster or the Moonwatch. Uh, this one is is called Moonwatch Professional Coaxial Master Chronometer Chronograph. It's got everything. Caliber 3861. Now remember the Caliber uh, 3861. Even though it has a Lamania base, it's hand wound. It's three hertz, 21,600 chronograph small second. It has a silicon balance spring. Uh, so you end up with a free sprung balance, which is at least according to uh, um, George Daniels, the way to go. But uh, a lot of people would rather have some kind of adjustments to the uh, to the hairspring, and you can't do that with silicon because it's too brittle. Now, if you if you look at the back, there's a little arrow there, and you can look at the balance cock, and there's no regulator there. Usually, the regulator is a little kind of arrow thing. Now, this is on a Speedmaster. When I first saw this, I thought, man, I tell you, there's there's that's just not the watch that went to the moon or anything like it. 
except uh, sort of, it, yeah, it does have a few things that were like it, but not quite the same. $7,200. I went to the next one, and this one I thought, oh boy, uh, this, is, this is sort of a cool watch. Speedmaster Moonwatch Professional Chronograph 42 millimeters. Now, it's got a solid back, but what I did, I superimposed the movement of the um, uh, caliber 1861 movement so you could see it. That's really sort of, I just sort of, like I said, superimposed it on a solid back. And there you can see the regulator, the little regulator there on the, um, on the uh, balance cock. And so if it's running too fast or slow, you can go in there and push it one way or the other or have a watchmaker do it for you. Uh, and so this is this is 1861 Lemania 1873 uh, base to it, hand wound, 48 hours, 3 hertz again, small seconds, 53.50. That's a pretty good price, I thought. I had a heck of a good price. Now, finally, what, again, going back to Seamaster, Speedmaster, I'm sorry, Speedmaster, this is the original, original. This is the caliber 321, chronograph, stainless steel, uh, 39.7 millimeter, interesting number there. And there you can see the regulator again on the 321. Now, um, this one, the Omega 321, it's manly wound uh, chronograph with a frequency of 2.5 hertz. Mm, love it, 18,000 VPH, 44 hours, 60 second chronograph register, a 30 minute counter and a 12 hour counter. 14,100. Now this is interesting because this is, this is the oldest type of, I guess, mechanical technology uh, and it costs the most. But it's also probably, I think it's actually the closest one uh, that they took to the moon. The ones they had on the moon all had solid backs, so, so uh, that part of it isn't. So what you have, what I was thinking that uh, sort of that Omega just sort of said, okay, we're going all uh, silicon hairsprings like Patek Philippe did, but they didn't. They have, a, they have quite a nice variety, some of which are silicon hairsprings, which have all kinds of preferable uh, features to them that uh, I don't care about. <laughs> so does my iPhone. Uh, but they also have kept things in the more traditional mode and those are the watches I like so I'm very happy to see what they've done with the Speedmaster two different movements on on the other hand though they said well okay we'll we'll throw one in with the uh, silicon hairspring for other kinds of reasons all right now after having talked about um you know the Speedmaster at length one thing I thought I would talk about and this is this is something that it keeps shrinking and shrinking in terms of the variety of models they have in Rolex Cellini's. And the Cellini moon face is the only one they have left. And, and looking at it, it was, you know, again, it's 28,800, 4 hertz uh, movement on the caliber 3195, 48 hours, $26,750. Well, like I said, I like this. I like the hand date. The hand date goes around uh, the outside and has a little cup for the different dates. It's got a moon phase. I, I don't, I mean, a moon phase is sort of an interesting little trinket to have on your watch. I have a couple of them. I, <laughs> I, unfortunately, I don't pay much attention to them. But this is a wonderful watch. It really is. I mean, for a dress watch, it's it's gold. It's it's nicely done. It's uh, and it has a uh, paramagnetic blue parachrome hairspring. Again, you're using instead of using uh, metalloids like uh, silicon, this one is using a transition metal. Uh, the parachrome is made up of niobium and chromium plus some other other secret ingredients, I guess. But anyway, in comparing these two, I think there, there are fewer surprises with Rolex. And I don't mean that as a criticism. I mean that Rolex has been doing incredibly well and they have these gradual improvements and that's fine. Uh, uh, 
Omega, on the other hand, is going through a lot of changes because I know that Swatch does this big thing about the silicon hairsprings are mass produced. They don't, they have all kinds of advantages. Uh, but so does my iPhone, and uh, so does a quartz watch. So I'm not going to get into that fight. But I, I got to tell you, in comparing these two, I was more surprised by Omega than I was Rolex. Like them both. Uh, would really like to hear your opinion. And until next time, this is Bill Sanders for Watch Art Side, the art and science of watch collection.